Hey guys, what's up? So it is a beautiful day outside and I dropped Kato off at school this morning. Um, did a little parent collaboration with his therapist. Um, Kato's school is really awesome because it's centered around ABA and they really push parent involvement because like we're parents, we're not ABA therapists so we don't really know, you know, the this, I mean ABA is a science so you know, we need to be trained essentially on ABA and like the appropriate ways to respond to certain behaviors that our children display. Um, and I'll really touch base a lot about that um, and pretty much why I do what I do, why I react how I react with Kid Ill in this vlog. So we are gonna do the vlog that I have been talking about the last couple of vlogs, um, which is the question and answer. So first of all, I really love you guys' comments. Like, I may not necessarily respond to them all like I would like to, but um, you know, just because I, I'm i busy. I mean, I do have a full-time job and um, you know, Kato keeps me busy and out of breath all the time. So, you know, I mean, but I love, like I absolutely love reading y'all's comments. Y'all are so supportive, you're so sweet, you're so understanding. And you know, ultimately at the end of the day, the whole point of doing this is just to open up me and Kittle's world to you guys, share our autism experience, and you know, hopefully we can relate to some people and we can help some people. And y'all have helped me through a lot of your comments you know y'all have given me great ideas you've given me moral support like you know it's just been an awesome experience so far and i really appreciate you guys i love all of my subscribers and my commenters and let's just get started with this q a vlog because i'm so excited for some of the feedback that i've gotten from y'all so um you know good questions my glasses on because I am not good at reading the screen without my glasses so okay hi this is from Danielle hi what are your thoughts on his screen time that would be a tough habit habit to break um, for sure Danielle I definitely agree with you on that I mean it's kind of a common theme with kids on the spectrum um, the whole screen time YouTube thing that's a tough question to answer because, you know, as a, an adult, as a nurse, um, as a parent, I realize that screen time is not necessarily beneficial. However, with kids on the spectrum, um, they tend to, you know, the re the way that kid will first got into screen time in the tablet is because um, he, well, first of all, he just loves videos. I mean, there's no getting around it. Like, he loves videos. He loves characters. He's got, like, a handful of characters that he loves. He loves Barney. He loves Elmo. He loves all that PBS stuff, like Caillou and Zoo and all that stuff. Um, so, I mean, nowadays, he pretty much just likes to use it because he likes to watch fun videos and sing-along songs he he's very repetitive so he loves to like watch the same song over and over and over I don't know what purpose that serves for Kato I don't I don't know why he likes to watch the same part of the same video over and over all I know is it makes him really happy so enough said I'm sold if it makes him happy if it brings him joy I'm gonna let him watch it um, you know, and I'm always careful about like looking over his shoulder, making sure what he's watching is appropriate because there's so many weirdos out there and there's so many people that do like voiceovers of like innocent kids songs and stuff that like you do have to be careful. And there is also YouTube Kids that I recommend because it tries to filter out some of that stuff for you. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I tend to be a little neutral on most subjects just because that's my personality. Like I'm just pretty laid back. I choose my battles. Um, I can tell when Kadel's had too much screen time just from knowing him. So I really try to um, 
pick up on his body language and his cues. If he's starting to get a little worked up, if he's starting to get kind of like stemmy, you know, Kate, one of Kato's biggest stems is he'll push his face and he like, he'll just like take his hands and just kind of push his face like that. And he does it when he's upset. He does it when he's happy. He does it when he's excited and he does it just randomly for no reason sometimes. So, um, when he's starting to do that kind of over and over is when it's okay, enough screen time. Let's go outside. We're going to go on a walk or we're going to go to the park go on a car ride or something like that. So, um, however, a lot of kids use iPads for communication. Kadel used to. Kadel did not start talking until he was six years old. Up until the age of six years old, he was 100% nonverbal. He had a lot of that like babble jibber jabber, but none of it had any meaning to it. None of it was approximation of words. None of it really seemed intentional. It was just jibber jabber. Um, so he did, he used PEX, which is picture exchange communication system. And it was an app on his tablet and he would pick the pic and there was hundreds of pictures he had. He would pick the picture and he'd pull it down, click on it and it would tell him, it would speak for him. Um, and that's actually kind of how we got into talking. But anyways, I feel like I've been rambling. So yeah. I'm kind of in the middle on screen time. Um, I think it's really just a parent by parent, family by family situation. And I am a huge advocate for not judging. Don't judge other parents. Don't judge other families. If you are out at a restaurant with your family and you see another family and their, you know, 10 year old is glued to his phone, don't judge them. That is the most like offensive thing because I remember when I was younger and like I would go out to dinner with my family or my grandparents or whatever and they would comment you know like oh that kid over there is just they just threw the phone in front of them or you know that kid over there is being bad they need to take him out or whatever consider the idea that maybe that kid's autistic maybe he's got something going on that I don't know about Maybe that video that he watches on YouTube or Netflix or whatever, maybe that's that kid's way of self-regulating and self-calming. Gives him something to focus on. Restaurants can be intimidating for Kato. You know, I don't take him to fancy restaurants. I try to take him to restaurants to where there's already a lot of like loud noise going on. But, um, but yeah, don't judge other families for giving their kids an iPhone or a tablet or whatever in a restaurant because it may be helping that kid to cope because being at a restaurant can be extremely difficult. You know, you don't know how hard it is for that kid to be at the restaurant. Um, and so that may be their way of coping. So don't judge them. Don't judge other families on screen time. Um, I don't think that it should replace children's independent activities. I think that they should find, in addition to the, the tablet, I think that they should find other ways to self-entertain, you know, playing with toys. And a lot of that stuff you have to teach kids with autism. They don't naturally pick up on social cues, a lot of natural milestones, you know, they don't really pick up on. You have to, like, Kato is never into toys as a young child. I'd buy him toys for Christmas or his birthday or whatever, and he was never really into them. But then I figured out I have to teach him how to play with this toy. He's not just going to know how to do it. So, yeah. So I definitely think that screen time is fine. It's fine. They can have screen time. They can watch YouTube. If that's what makes them happy, that's what makes them happy. But I think that one thing that I've learned this year in particular is um, moderation. So that's kind of been a big learning lesson for me because Kato gets fixed on things and obsessed on things. So one thing that his therapist has really been trying to like drill in my head is moderation. And that applies across any subject area, whether it's screen time or um, whatever, moderation, you know. All right, I've spent eight minutes on screen time, so <laughs> let me move on. All right. Hi, was Kadel vaccine injured too? My daughter was vaccine injured 
and developed autism because of it. I'm very sorry, um, D, DGC, um, that's terrible. I mean, that's terrible. Um, I can't even imagine like going through that. I can't even imagine knowing for a fact that, you know, my child was, you know, given, I don't know if it was an accident. I have heard of cases to where the doctor's office accidentally gives them, you know, double the vaccine they were supposed to get. And it was proven in court that that was what caused their autism like symptoms. That's horrible. I mean, I, I feel for you. I am sympathetic towards that situation because it's a hard pill to swallow. Like people that don't have kids, families, or loved ones with autism are very quick to judge on people who choose to not vaccinate. And again, I'm pretty neutral on this subject. Being that I'm a nurse in the medical field, I obviously, there is no arguing the under the importance of vaccinating your children. Of course, it is beneficial to vaccinate your children. Um, however, I mean, I also, there's something to say for the fact that number one, we do not know what causes autism. Let me say it again. We do not know what causes autism. So you cannot stand there and you cannot judge somebody for not wanting to vaccinate their children. Or you cannot just judge somebody for being suspicious that vaccines could have possibly contributed to their child's autism. I know of people who, you know, their child was perfectly normal. They were perfectly typical neurofunctioning children hitting all their milestones. They go in, they get their three-year-old shots, and bam, they stop talking, they regress, they start with, you know, all these crazy rigid behaviors, and coincidence? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not saying that vaccines cause autism, but I'm saying there is a possibility that they contribute to autism. You know, there could be a genetic predisposition and the vaccines contribute to it. I don't know, y'all. I'm not a neurologist. I'm not a scientist. I don't know. Just because the CDC says that there's no proven evidence that vaccines cause autism doesn't really mean a whole lot because they don't know what does cause autism. So until somebody can tell me black and white, we have proven that genetic marker causes autism or, you know, eating bubblegum causes autism. I don't know until they can tell me like specifically what causes autism. I'm not going to judge people who are suspicious of vaccines. I'm not pretty sure that I'm going to get some negative feedback for that, but whatever. Um, but as far as Kadel goes, I don't necessarily think that he was vaccine injured. Um, you know, looking back, I definitely saw some signs before he was completely um, vaccinated. I think that I noticed it a lot more after he was vaccinated, but it was also around his diagnosis time and um, it was just kind of a lot more stuff did come out after he was vaccinated, like a lot more behaviors, a lot more, you know, really severe stems and just really rigid behaviors and stuff like that. It was more obvious after he was vaccinated. However, I do think that I saw a lot of signs beforehand. So, you know, I can't necessarily blame vaccines, but, um, you know, I don't blame people that are suspicious. I don't, and I butchered that. The Morales family. Oh my gosh, the cutest little baby. I agree. What age was he diagnosed, if you don't mind me asking? Also for the Q&A, what sign did you notice when he was younger that made you think he had autism? My son, 21 months old, also has ASD. We start ABA next Monday. Yay! That's so exciting. I'm so um, excited for you guys to start ABA. I know there's a lot of ABA non-supporters out there, but guess what? I am an ABA supporter, and here's why. Because... Um, Kiddo was diagnosed at two years old. I definitely saw a lot of signs and symptoms beforehand. 
Um, he just seemed to be kind of like an anxious little baby. Um, you know, I remember, you know, him kind of like crying a lot. I remember it seemed like he was only, he would only like kind of calm down and settle down if it was like me holding him. And being a young parent, I mean, and he was my first one, I didn't know that that was necessarily abnormal. I had no clue. I had nothing to compare it to. So I just remember like, I remember my extended family and my family just wanting to like hold him so bad because he was like the cutest little baby who was so chunky and they just wanted to like hold him and cuddle him. And as soon as I would go to like hand him over, he would just wig out. So I would have to like immediately take him back. Um, so that's one thing I remember. I also remember he would always like put stuff in his mouth and I always attributed it to like, oh, he's just teething. He's just teething. But then even past the age of like where he's not really teething anymore, he kept doing it and I didn't really realize it didn't occur to me that he's done teething. He shouldn't be continuing to like chew on TV remotes or, you know, he had a lot of like, he would try to eat sand. He would try to eat dirt. Like he was just constantly mouthing objects. So that was another kind of thing that, um, that was a little bit of a red flag, but not a huge red flag. Cause I didn't really know like how abnormal that was. But the biggest thing I think that I noticed was when he was a baby, I put him into daycare at about, it was before his diagnosis. So it was before two, I put him into daycare. I was in nursing school. So, you know, obviously I had to go to class. I needed, and my parents work, my, both my parents have full-time jobs. So I needed daycare. I had to do it. I was a single mom. I had to do it. So I put him in daycare and I just remember, um, it being really, really difficult for him. Like he had a lot of separation anxiety that he never really got over. Um, I mean, eventually like years later he did, but it was just really hard for him. And I remember his daycare pointing out to me, there was a really sweet lady that worked in his classroom. And I remember her saying, you know, I'm kind of concerned that maybe he doesn't hear very well. And I said, well, why would you be concerned about that? And she said, well, because I say his name to try to get his attention and he doesn't turn to look at me. He doesn't even acknowledge me. It's as if he, you know, doesn't hear me. So I thought, oh my gosh, like maybe he's deaf. Well, not deaf. I mean, I knew he heard because if I accidentally slammed a door or whatever, he'd turn, if it scared him, he'd turn and look. So I thought that's odd, but you know, let's get it checked out. That checked out normal. Um, so it just became, I guess, a little bit more obvious that he wasn't really hitting those milestones, um, the way that he should be, lack of eye contact. Um, he was always really affectionate and like that was never an issue. He engaged with me and like a handful of other people that he enjoyed. But yeah, so he never really responded to his name. It's like he didn't realize that that was his name. Um, so I went and got him, his hearing tested. I got him into, um, early intervention just to make sure that like everything was normal and they said you know like we can't be the ones to diagnose so you know we're gonna provide you with um, like some speech therapy because at that point around like one one and a half he really wasn't trying to communicate at all like you know even even little babies will try to communicate you know they'll try to repeat mama Ba ba, whatever, and he would—he never did any of that. So he never really even attempted to communicate. He would just get really frustrated, really whiny, cryy, just upset. But um, I didn't realize why. Um, so yeah. 